my name is Noam. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, virtual template functions. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been a developer in C++ for uh, a little bit over two decades now, so a fair bit of time. Um, I don't have a lot of online presence, but there's my uh, LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn page and uh, Twitter handler if for some reason uh, you want to connect with me. I don't talk about much there, but anyway. And uh, the thing about virtual template functions that I'm going to talk about today is that they don't exist. Uh, virtual and template are not mechanisms that work together and they can't be reasonably made to work together. Um, so a few disclaimers uh, before we begin. Um, this is the half hour version of this talk. There was an hour version of this talk. So uh, there are going to be a few things that I'm going to say and not justify because we don't have the time for that. Uh, I will ask that we'll keep the questions to the end. So we'll make sure that we cover everything that, uh, uh, that we want to cover. And uh, the last point is that this isn't exemplary code what I'm going to show you. Uh, it's work, it's all in Godbolt and it all compiles and works, but whenever there was a, a question of make it short and fit uh, into a small space or make it uh, more uh, C++ uh, solid uh, code, I chose the short version even if it's not 100% uh, safe, as it were. Okay, so let me start by uh, giving you a use case to justify why do we even need uh, to use virtual template uh, functions. So my use case is that I want to decouple in my program by logging or my uh, debugging, uh, outputting any kind of information uh, using dependency injection. Why I want to do that? Because if I use dependency injection, for example, it's very easy for me to, to start writing uh, unit tests for that code to check that I actually output the information that I want to output. How do I uh, use dependency injection? Usually I have some abstract class that has virtual uh, uh, functions, and, and I inject the actual implementation of that, uh, uh, of that interface, meaning the derived class from the abstract class, uh, to the function when I want to use it. This works great in most cases. The problem here is that I want to support printing various types of information that I don't know uh, when I write the interface what they are going to be. If I knew, for example, that I want to support only integers and uh, strings, I could write one virtual function to output the integer, one virtual function to output the string, and I'll be done. But if I want to support types that the user will then define later on, then I can't do that. I need to use another mechanism. In this case, uh, a sort of template virtual function would have been great. I could have write, take whatever uh, type that the user give you and can be outputted, use that, and output it outwards. But as we said, this doesn't work. But just because we don't have a template virtual function doesn't mean we don't have options. We have options. There are things we can do to make it work. So I'm going to present you with a few options and based on your particular use case, you can choose whichever one suits you best. So let's uh, look at the first option. Uh, use inheritance instead of a template. If, for example, I will declare that uh, all my types have to inherit from, uh, from, a, base from a base type that, that implements print, for example, then the user can derive from that base type whatever type they want, pass it along to the system, and, uh, and it will work. Uh, so I have a Godbolt uh, link here, so let me just show, share it with you. So this is, the, uh, this is what I have here. I have a base class, which actually implement print. You can't see it. Ah, let's uh, try and do this. Okay. And 
Now it works. Excellent. So uh, I have a, a base structure that uh, implements a virtual function print. Sure. Better? More? Let's do one more. Uh, I have a, a, a base class here that implements some virtual function called print. Uh, it's okay. We will we will get to that. First of all, we are here, still here, so this line is still visible entirely. And when we get to the draft class, we will uh, scroll it a bit if we need to. Or I can actually even do this. Don't uh, don't need that. And whenever I have uh, my derived class, for example, I have a class that uh, implement that has uh, holds two integers. I don't know it's a pair or it's a complex number or whatever. And that class uh, overrides the virtual uh, function. And my interface gets uh, do something with a, with a reference to a base class. And my implementation can just call the virtual print function. And if I have an instance of a type derived one and I uh, pass it to uh, something that implements my, uh, my interface, I print one, one comma two, which is what the, the value would be. And this has a, a few advantages and one really big disadvantage. The, uh, the big advantages are there are no templates in the solution at all, which means no code blot. Uh, people who are uh, less comfortable with templates should be able to easily understand this code. And it's from all the solutions that I'm going to show you, the best one in terms of performance. There's no overhead here except an additional uh, virtual function call, which is very, very cheap. The big downside is I have to use uh, something that is derived from base. So I can, for example, pass an integer to this interface. So this is an excellent solution, but it sort of requires you to design your entire system and the entire use of the interface based on this fact that you need to derive from that base class. If you're in a situation where that is uh, reasonable for you to do, that's good. Otherwise, you need a different solution. But the main key that I want you to take from this is we kind of did something amazing here. We had a problem that we thought we needed generative uh, code templates to solve, and we actually solved it with the object-oriented approach. So they can be switched between one another it's, uh, uh, in some sense. The fact that we have a, a language that supports many uh, development paradigms is very powerful and we should consider that and not immediately jump to, oh, I need a generative uh, code, I need templates. You have other options and other ways to, to, to do things. Let's go back. I'll do that. If you don't mind, I'll skip the uh, presentation so it will be easier for me to switch to the guard bolts. The second option. Okay, we can't write a function that is uh, virtual and templated. That won't work. But we can write two functions, one which will be the templated and, what we do, and one which will be virtual. The templated uh, function will have the job of reducing whatever uh, uh, type we get into some common type that we will work with. And the virtual function will use that uh, common type. For example, if I'm going to use print, I can uh, push whatever object I get into, say, string stream. That will work because it's a printable uh, whatever that I get. And now I have string stream. It's a concrete type that I know and I can pass as a, as a, 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 as a parameter to a virtual function. So we will do that. And we'll switch to this link. And this is what we're doing here. So, uh, mm -hmm. no, it's the same one, right? 
Yeah. Let me just try and find it here. Okay, here's, here it is. So here I have an interface which takes, uh, which has a templated function called do something. It gets, I don't know which type, but what I understand is that I can take a string stream and push the whatever type I got into the string stream, effectively printing it. And I have a do something impel, which is a virtual function, which will take the string stream and pass it to the actual implementation to work with. So if you can think about it as something as serialize and deserialize, if I can serialize whichever object I get into a concrete type that I know of, I can use that to pass the uh, information to the virtual function, and I can deserialize the, uh, the result and get it back. In this case, I don't need to deserialize because the printing just uh, doesn't ret return void, but if I wanted to, I could do that as well. And uh, here I can actually put whatever, uh, almost anything that I want. Uh, for example, in this case, I print 42, the number, which is not derived from anything uh, uh, that I created. So the good news is that this works. This is something that we use in production quite a lot. It's a very good solution. Uh, there is some template overhead here, so some code blot, uh, but not a lot. The, the case where this gets complicated is what happens if you can just reduce whatever type you get into a common type and then work with that. What happens if you actually have to reduce it to a type, get a value, ask something, maybe reduce it to something else. When you have to start to interact with the, with the object several times, you start to get into a really complicated template function and a lot of virtual function to, to, to work with. So if, for example, uh, uh, I had to call uh, do something impel and check the return value, and based on the return value, do something else, my code would get really complicated. So we have a solution for that as well. If we had uh, one option, which was uh, to use an object-oriented uh, approach, and one option that uh, used the uh, generative uh, here uh, to generate the reduction to a common type, we can combine them. So what would that look like? So the first, in the first approach, we had, a, we had a base class and we derived from it. Well, the templated function can do that for us. And then we're back to the, uh, to the first case. But that means that all of the functionality that we want get passed along with it. So if, for example, in my base class, I need to uh, uh, implement five function, not just one, all those five functions will now be available to the implementation immediately. The impl I don't need and the template level to decide what to, what to call when. I just pass it on to the implementation and the implementation can decide on its own. So again, an example. So uh, here I have uh, in my interface the, the base class, which I had before, which again use print but could use five different other functions as well. And I have the, and I have templated derived class, which will be created based on the, uh, based on the actual, uh, result, based on the actual type that, that I've been passed to. And I can see that here in the, in the, in the do something. Do something creates a derived type based on the actual data that I get and pass it along to the implementation. 
And the implementation can do whatever they want. They can call whichever function of base that I have. And that is a good solution. It's, there's a bit of an overhead here in creating entire new types and uh, quite a lot of code bloat, but it's very generic. Not entirely generic. If I uh, com comment in this code, we will see that, this, that it stops working. So we need to fix a few things here uh, to make sure it catches all the cases. But it's a generalized solution that we can apply almost every case. It will cost us, but uh, uh, but we can do so. But we can work with it. Okay, I'm going to rush forward because I'm running out of time. So those are the three uh, solutions that uh, I think you can consider uh, if you want a reasonable solution. Reasonable is not, I think, one of the things that people will use as, to describe me, so I'm going to give you also a, a non-reasonable solution, which is we could use reflection. C++ is known to have a lot of reflection provided that you implement it. So uh, this is a little bit of this. So, okay, where did it go? Okay, so what do I have here? Very quickly, because I want to give time for uh, answers. I have, a, I have a map, which uh, uh, for every name and, ty and type gives me a, a pointer to a function behind the scenes. And what I have is, is, a, is a function that, uh, given uh, the name of a function and, uh, and its type, returns, returns to me the pointer if it exists. That's why I have a std optional. And I'm going to rush here just uh, so we can uh, see an example. The end result is that the implementation tries to uh, get the function. If the function exists, it can cause it with C out by, in this case, uh, to print itself out. And if not, uh, it, it says that uh, no print function was found. And I can pass to it string, uh, char arrays, integers, custom types, and whether or not they have uh, print functions, it will be used. And if it doesn't have a print function, it will just say, well, I, I can't do what you asked me to do. Uh, so I, I know this is a very rushed, but uh, I'm running out of time. So I'm sorry for that. Uh, but I can either I can take questions, or if you want to go over this in more details, I can also do that. Any questions? Yes. Scroll up a bit and explain it again. Sure. Okay, so I have a best class that implements my, uh, my reflection. What does it mean that it re implements my reflection? It means it ha knows in some way that it has a function by, uh, uh, that is called foo and, and what parameters it takes. So that's what the function maps here it does. It has for a, for a name and a type of a function, which I've encoded here in some way. It returns a pointer to that function behind the scene. It's a pointer to the inner base, which actually uh, what, what, what it calls a derived from that inner base, which just contains a std function. So really, at the end of the day, this points to a std function. In a process, we call iterator. Yes. Yes, it's called type erasing. And what I do here is when somebody ask, asks me for, for a function, it needs to provide me the return type and the arguments for the function that they want to get and the name. And again, I using the information I got, I encode the type that they actually wanted. I try to find it in the map. And if I, if I, if I found it in the map, then I know what type it was because I search it by the type and I can return the, uh, remove the erasure and return the, uh, the real type and return the std function to you. And if I didn't find it, then uh, null opt, we, didn't, we don't have that, uh, uh, that option. Where is the map? Where is the, the values of the map? 
where, does, where do the values of the map come from? Excellent. So I have a function here that adds to the map, and I need to call it. And how do I do that? Uh, for example, uh, here in the derived, I actually just, in the constructor, uh, added that call to the map. This is the graph that's called from this base. Okay, it's tricky, I know. And uh, then in the implementation, I can uh, try and see if uh, whether or not I have a print function and add that print function to the, uh, to the base and call it. So uh, again, Sfina a little bit. Yes? Why to do it like this and not like for the get examples? Why do it like this and not like in the previous examples? Yeah. What's the advantage? So you can do it in the, like in the other examples. That would work. What this lets you do, in the other examples, we assume that the type has a print function. If we were to give it a type that doesn't have a print function, we would have a compilation error. In this example, we try to detect whether or not we have a print function. So if we pass a, a variable that doesn't have a print function, we don't fail, we just don't add, that we just don't add the function. Why, why, does it, why is it useful? Because if we want to extend the API, so say I had an API with five functions, and now I want to support six functions, but I don't want to go and change all the code that I previously had and make sure everybody adds the sixth function as well. This will let me detect whether I'm using a new type that has also the sixth function, or the old type that only has five, that only has five functions and I can, can, can add it. It's a bit of a, there's a lot of boilerplate code here to make it, to make it work. Hopefully one day we'll have a compile time uh, reflection and we can just make, make the compiler generate all that code for us. Um, but for now I have to write it by hand. Can't you also do this with the uh, Yes, the answer is yes. The, 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 the Sphinx type will definitely work with concepts. The, uh, the, the reason I did it here is because I didn't have the concept ready and it was shorter to just write the Sphinx directory directly instead of writing the concept and then use it. Again, like I said in the beginning, I tried to squeeze, the, to squeeze it to, to the shortest amount of text and so I forgo defining the concept uh, exactly. Yes. So will it work with the private uh, uh, members and, and functions? So yes, yes it will work. That's one of the dangers in reflection. Whatever you expose in the reflection would be visible. If you expose in the reflection something that is private, you implicitly made it public through the exception, through the, through the reflection. So the, this mechanism is, doesn't respect in a, in a certain sense the division the between public and private that you that you get otherwise. Yes. Do I, do I recommend using this method? Generally, no. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, it's really cool, and, and it's used, uh, and, and, it, and uh, it, it's not it's not cheap performance wise. Uh, the the maintaining the the map uh, that calls all the all the all the, all the functions is, is costly. You should be careful here if you copy or move this object because you don't want uh, 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 to have a dangling references. It's dangerous. That being said, for an extreme cases, it's something to consider. I actually do use it in production, something similar to that in production code, but it's. You have to be very, very careful and make sure uh, it, it has been used correctly and maybe make a, a wrapper around it that uh, will protect the developers from uh, doing something that they, that they shouldn't do. For example, here, uh, I, uh, in the best class, I disable the copy and move constructors. 
because those are dangerous if you move the if you move them and the map doesn't update correctly. The move and the copy. So that's that's for example a protection that I made against, uh, which also of course limits how you can use this object. If it's not copyable and not movable, it limits its usage. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so I, again, I apologize for the briefness, uh, but thank you for uh, coming in and listening. Thank you. <laughs>